I'm Catherine King, Marketing Manager, and I'll be hosting the webinar. I'll be taking your questions to ask at the end, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat function and someone will help you. I'm delighted to introduce Martin Parker, editor of Life After COVID-19, The Other Side of Crisis, which is the first book in our new COVID-19 collection. It showcases our content on this global challenge to encourage broader perspectives and collaborations across the globe and disciplinary boundaries. Details of how to pre-order the book will be available in the chat below. Martin is Professor of Organisation Studies at the University of Bristol and the lead for Inclusive Economy Initiative. His most recent books are Shut Down the Business School, published by Pluto in 2018, and Ana Anarchism, My Management and Organisation, published by Routledge earlier this year. So, what might the world look like in the aftermath of COVID-19? It's now evident that almost every aspect of society will change after the pandemic, but if we learn lessons, then life can be better. Martin will discuss ideas that might put us on alternative paths for positive social change, inviting us to see the pandemic as a dress rehearsal for the larger problem of climate change. After his talk, there'll be time for questions. I'm now going to hand over to Martin. Hello there, and thanks for turning up and listening. So um, I'm just going to talk for about 10 minutes just sort of summarising some of the ideas in the book and explaining why the book came about, really. Um, and I'd be really happy to take questions and try and respond to, to your ideas. I guess that, like most of us, um, you know, live, living in Bristol as I do and lock, being locked down in um, mid-March, I had some very, very mixed feelings about the experience. So on the one hand, um, my my life i you know i've got a garden and i was working at home and all sorts of stuff that my life was becoming in many ways quite simple quite um more more, more straightforward than it had been uh, previously at the same time that you know we were surrounded by images of death and suffering and hearing about people who couldn't work at home who you know drove taxis or were working in the nhs and so on so the experience of covid is clearly one that's not evenly distributed in any way but at the same time lots of people were starting to talk about quite quickly about this idea that there were certain things about the covid crisis that we almost needed to preserve and to think about so the most direct and the earliest one was the very rapid uh, reduction in carbon emissions for example um, i remember quite early on seeing some images of um wildlife coming back into the um, canals of Venice, um, which were suddenly no longer polluted um, by presumably all the boats and whatever else, all the people who are there. And this idea that somehow nature was recovering, that things were returning to normal. At the same time, my own sort of experience was that I was, you know, doing more cooking, um, talking to people about, well, you know, going online for quizzes and doing a lot of gardening. Uh, spending more time with uh, my partner and quite a long time online with various relatives and so on. And much less running around, much less traveling, obviously. So this sort of idea that in a sense that this was also a kind of the, the promise of a slower, quieter and probably less carbon intensive life. Quite quickly after that, again, of course, then we started to see a whole series of memes really which were trying to bottle this sort of idea that that covid had presented us with an opportunity to pause to reset quite a common metaphor um, for an economy and a way of living our lives that was simply unsustainable both personally and for the planet so you started to see things like the sort of hashtag no going back closed for good and of course probably the most popular one build back better the common sort of base to all of those metaphors, I suppose, is the idea that for a moment we have a chance to breathe, to think, to, to imagine how life might be lived differently. And all around us, of course, what we were starting to see was very rapid changes in the way that um, the state and organisations were um, uh, dealing with the crisis. So, for example, we've been told repeatedly by uh, successive governments, most particularly Theresa May's, that there was no magic money tree. 
And then suddenly the state was borrowing money to furlough people and to uh, invest in building a hospital in a week and all sorts of stuff like that. So it looked like, you know, state intervention was becoming possible. At the same time, you're starting to see enormous amount of volunteering and mutualism. I think it was, was it something like three quarters of a million people who offered to volunteer for the NHS? And there were endless stories about various kind of mutual support networks, about the way in which businesses were repurposing themselves, big business trying to connect to a variety of community businesses and so on. So it looked like the kind of the world was reconfiguring in a sense. So partly because of that, I then started to think, well, you know, we need to capture this moment. We need to find some way almost of kind of documenting the possibilities that now look like they are emergent as a result of this crisis. You know, crisis being a moment where we might be able to stop and choose something different. Um, a portal, as the, the author Arundhati Roy put it, to a different, a, a different possibility of living our lives. So I started to think about this very um, quick and dirty book with uh, Bristol University Press, the one that we're discussing, and you know, talk, talk to people there and a whole bunch of my friends, both academics and activists, many of them based in the, in the Bristol region. Um, and I gave them about, oh, I think, something like a week to pitch me a very quick um, idea for a 3,000 word chapter. Um, and I was deluged with responses. Within a week, I'd had something like 30 different chapters proposed from a whole variety of people, some of them academics, many of them uh, civil society activists in a whole range of organisations in Bristol and the Bristol region. Um, I had to lose about half of the chapters because it simply wasn't possible to get everything in. So apologies to any of those authors who are watching this. But picking the kind of, I think we've got 17 chapters in here, very short chapters, and each of them concerned with an aspect of, of life after, or the potential of life, life after COVID. So chapters on working from home, on climate change, on leadership, on the idea of growth, um, on the role of the state and thinking particularly about the position of the migrant, um, about cash and virtual money. Uh, after all, it's becoming, I was in a, um, I was in a pub yesterday uh, and I was told I couldn't pay by cash. It simply wasn't possible. So they would actually turn me away, I suppose, if I turned up with cash. A chapter on food, uh, something on artificial intelligence and a whole series of other things. So a set of chapters which in each, in, in, in a variety of different ways, take a particular facet of our lives and kind of open that up to thinking about the possibility of more enduring change. So let me just illustrate that in the sort of the last five minutes of, of this by talking about one of these examples. And it's the one that in a sense has been discussed most, I guess, so particularly discussed by the kind of people I hang around with, mostly you know, academics knowledge workers in the broadest sense. And that's the idea of working from home. So I'm speaking to you from a home office in North Bristol. Um, the University of Bristol, since the middle of March, has effectively been run off um, kitchen tables and home offices right the way across the southwest of England and elsewhere. It's become a virtual organisation in a sense and most of its physical material properties have been, uh, have been lying empty, uh, patrolled by security guards and so on. Now, that's a very common experience for anybody who works in you know, broadly conceived the knowledge industries. And it's one really that's only been made possible over the last five or 10 years with contemporary developments in um, teleconferencing, in um, effectively kind of digital technologies that allow for quite complicated forms of interaction. So that sounds like it might be one of the ways in which COVID is going to assist a certain kind of change and more of us working from home. But let's just follow through some of the implications of that. And you can see, hopefully, that even a small change like that has some huge implications for a whole series of other things. So, for example, if we start to think about the times and spaces of work, then that has a huge impact on the way in which we can imagine the place of the home and the place of the office. For the last couple of hundred years, the way in which most people have thought about cities, and Bristol would be no exception, is somewhere where you go to the center of the city in order to perform various kinds of labor, and then you go back to the suburbs 
or you know whatever it is in order to uh, in order to live so so cities kind of pulse inwards and outwards on a daily basis right and the center of the city in that sense becomes a particularly important place because it's a place that not only has huge office blocks you think about all the, the office blocks around Temple Mead station but also lots of kind of bits of infrastructure of sandwich shops and so on and transport interchange and so on that's supporting that kind of um, that, that, that kind of you know, pulsing of the commuters. Now, that might not be the case in the future. You know, work maybe will be much more distributed, that we won't think about work as something that we need to go to the centre of Bristol for. So what are the implications of that? Well, one of them is clearly an implication about people's homes. So to some extent, the employer is going to require or need, at the very least, uh, people who can work at home. And that means that people are going to need home offices, for example. So we can think about, you know, the design of the house as being a bit of a problem because most domestic houses in the UK are not designed with offices, office with workspace built in. It also presents a series of problems in terms of anyone who's got caring responsibilities, anyone who has um, other, other duties, if you like, that they carry out in the household. I'm lucky my kids have left home. So in that sense, I'm only responsible for myself. But you know, many of my colleagues are trying to look after children and work in the same kind of spaces. And that's clearly presenting enormous problems. We could spin that back into the design of offices themselves. So if we assume, for example, that uh, lots of big organizations will no longer need as much office space, effectively, that means that lots of the often very big speculative, speculative developments that have been constructed in city centres over the last 10, 20 years, and again, you know, Bristol, no exception, are going to be empty, or at least partly empty over the next couple of years. So any of you who've got money in um, speculative office development, I'd pull it out now if I were you. There's then a whole series of implications in terms of the ways that we might think about transportation. So it may be city centres won't be quite as important in terms of the idea that that's the place that you go to, to be entertained, to work, to eat, whatever it is. Perhaps we might be living a more spatially distributed life. And maybe that means that towns and villages will become, um, will, net, will need to develop the kind of infrastructure that allows them to support a working population rather than assuming uh, as, we, as we would for many towns there now, that they would be kind of dormitory suburbs for a big, a big city centre. It's obviously going to have an implication for property prices too. And then just the other you know, quick thing to think about is in terms of the way in which ideas about time might change. So you know, one of the features of the, the working day, if you like, the nine to five, the eight to six, or whatever it is, is, this idea that we all work on, we work on similar kinds of schedules. Of course, that no longer really becomes necessary. The word asynchronous is being talked about a lot uh, in the kind of context I'm in. So the idea that you might, for example, as with this, uh, take various pieces of content, record various pieces of content, and then use it later. There's no particular reason to assume that we all have to be physically co-present in the same place at the same time. So all those possibilities kind of open up and it reconfigures our towns, our spaces, our times. And then the other question, of course, is, do we want that to happen? Do we want to spend our working lives isolated from other human beings, mostly, you know, spending a lot of time at home um, playing with a screen rather than with other warm bodies, uh, having cups of coffee and chatting and making jokes and all the rest of it. So there are kind of choices here about the reconfiguration of our lives that I think that the virus has opened up and that it's really important that we consider carefully, not only in terms of the redesign of, um, uh, redesign of cities, but really thinking about our collective futures, most particularly in terms of the uh, climate emergency. Thanks very much for listening. Now, I think Catherine's gonna come back in and moderate some questions. Yes, and um, we're getting lots of questions. Um, thank you very much to everybody. Oh, and first of all, thank you very much to you, Martin, for uh, your talk. It's all right, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Please um, continue to add some questions in the Q&A function. I'll um, get through as many as I can. We've got um, about 15 or 20 minutes, so we've got, there's quite a lot to get through. So, um, first of all, I have a question that says, who do you think will be the initial winners and losers of this new reality? from a social, cultural and economic point of view? And how do you think this will change over time? 
Mm, yeah. I mean, I think what we've seen already is the way in which COVID has impacted on different communities in very different ways. So, you know, I, I signaled that at the start, didn't I, in terms of talking about the idea of myself as, a, as very lucky in terms of not having caring responsibilities, being a knowledge worker and so on. But we can see that COVID has impacted on people very differentially, depending on social class, um, on ethnicity, um, on, you know, it's clear evidence that BAME people, for example, are much more vulnerable to COVID. And this seems to be largely because of the kind of occupations that they work in. Uh, on gender, in terms of the primary responsibility for caring, very often falling on women rather than men, and on people with disabilities of various different kinds, which technology can both exacerbate and ameliorate, depending on uh, the context. So I think I don't see any particular reason to assume that the crisis won't expose those tensions further. Yeah, so the kind of people who are going to lose their jobs, the kind of people who are going to be kicked out of their houses, the kind of people who aren't have enough to eat likely to be stratified in similar kinds of ways than the ones I've just described. The question then becomes how we can think about re-engineering a future that distributes the, uh, both the advantages and disadvantages uh, the advantages of, a, of a kind of COVID future more fairly than it is at present. Because, you know, in me, me I, I do feel very strongly on you know, me saying I've had, you know, the last four and a half months have been quite nice for me. Yeah. I've, I've, and, and that's a terrible thing to say, you know, I, I've been I've been so lucky in terms of my the particularities of my job and my life. Um, and that's clearly not the case for everybody. And that's simply wrong. Mm, no, I'm, and I, I feel the same sitting in my own home office as well. I echo a lot of what you're saying. Um, so I have a question from David Dewar, who says working life being distributed away from city centres, which become less important as hubs. He wonders how this might alter arts and leisure facilities generally in cities, like concert halls, recording, re rehearsal studios, etc. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? I, I, I often, when in thinking about this over the last couple of months, you know, if we start off with the assumption that lots and lots of things can be distributed in time and space, and we can do a whole variety of things on screens, you know, I, 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 I saw a fantastic big big band, a uh, big jazz band on a screen and they're all on separate things and they were, you know, coordinating, the, coordinating this stuff beautifully. It was remarkable what they could do, but it probably wasn't as much fun. I shouldn't think they enjoyed it as much. And, you know, I'd rather have seen them in the flesh. So there are clearly some things and maybe arts and culture are part of that where you want to be there. You know, I, I, uh, for my, uh, <laughs> for my sins, I sport Stoke City and I can watch Stoke City on the television, but it's not the same as actually going to the stadium and enjoying it. So the, there are certain things that I think we're going to make choices that we do want to spend time, you know, with other people sharing a particular kind of experience. It's just in a sense, it also allows us to think about all the dull, boring meetings that you have to go to or the endless commute that you're, you know, necessarily involved in or whatever it might be, you know, you can get out of stuff and maybe choose to be involved in different kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. So leading on from that, Nick Skelton asks, if we think that a substantial amount of working from home will continue, how can we help people whose homes or responsibilities don't fit well with working from home? Yeah, that's a really tough one, isn't it? So on the one hand, we can imagine various things that employers can do to assist, assist people with the technology um, in terms of providing the kind of support or laptops or whatever it might be, um, as well as presumably thinking about various kinds of income supplements or tax breaks or whatever it might be to pay for enhanced internet or you know whatever it is that people are going to need. That's all very well, but it's not going to solve the problem of say somebody who's got kids at home, you know, and 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 unless <laughs> unless employers are going to be sort of building rooms on people's houses, I'm not quite sure how that one works through really. I was talking to somebody who suggested that there was kind of early suggestions that houses with home offices were already starting to attract something of a premium. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, that's all very well for people who can afford houses with home offices, isn't it? For many people, that's not going to be the case. And there is a, there is a sense in which um, all, what, what we might see is effectively many of the costs of employment are effectively being pushed back onto the employee. Um, particularly onto the less well-paid employees, uh, which would be, of course, grossly unjust. Um, um, I ju a question about your book, actually, more. Um, Alison Herbert asks, what topics did you leave out of your book 
And what criteria did you use for inclusion? She's interested yes. in understanding the hierarchy of what people consider to be important yeah. in a version of our world. Yeah. Uh, just a supplementary question. How concerned were contributors about the scenario of virtual social relationships over real contact? <clears throat> so in terms of the first one, so I, I, had to, I had to say no to about 15 chapters. Um, I can't remember all the details of some of them that I put in. There was a, there was a very nice chapter on corporate law that, um, in retrospect, I wish I'd included. There was also a lovely chapter about play, the idea of play, which kind of was stimulated by the notion of spending time at home playing with children. And, and, and I really liked it, but I eventually was kind of pushed back on a series of sort of core topics um, you know, in terms of ideas about the state and cash and almost the kind of the big, I suppose, the big questions. But I'm increasingly of the opinion that there isn't a sphere of life that we couldn't talk about changing in various ways in a kind of um, a build back better post COVID world. After all, you know, particularly if we're going to take uh, climate change seriously and you know, we must. Uh, then you know any any sphere of our lives that involves emitting carbon, and that's pretty much all of them, needs to be rethought. So you know all all in any topics. In terms of the sort of the idea of living virtual lives, um, sort of. I mean, this is the, the, this is a, actually a very old dystopia. Um, I, I when I was doing some of the reading for the um, for the book, I was uh, I was looking again at a book, a, a short story by E. M. Forster, the novelist. Um, from about, I think it's about 1911, called When the Machine Stops, where Forster is writing about this sort of, um, this society in which everybody lives in these kind of burrows and they communicate with each other by these special kind of video telephone kind of apparatus. And he's bemoaning the fact that people, you know, effectively the story is kind of bemoaning the fact that people no longer have proper human contact with each other. That story is from over, over a century ago. And we've seen those kinds of, fears around the telephone, around the internet, around the television and so on. I think that people's drive to be with each other is sufficiently strong that no, no, real, no really dystopian future in that regard is likely. Again, going back to an earlier answer, the question is kind of deciding when we do it in a sense, isn't it? Because there's certain contexts in which I really do want to be with other people, others in which, yeah, it doesn't matter that much. And I certainly don't want to have to fly around the world just to go to some stupid meeting. <laughs> um, so I've got a question here from Rob McMillan on the public conversation. He says two challenges come to mind in the way the public conversation has been going, which severely constrain possibilities. One is the compelling urgency of we need to get back to normal as a narrative, particularly as the recession begins to grip. And two, imagining a better possibility after COVID requires organisation and political alliance building. He'd be interested to hear your comments on this. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the perfectly understandable desire for many people to go back to the status quo, to go back to the old normal, um, is, is, is regrettable, but, you know, as I said, understandable. I mean, I know why people want that stuff. The problem is that the previous economic system, economic and social system that we were living in, was both environmentally unsustainable and extraordinarily unjust. So the idea of preserving that seems to me particularly stupid. It's just that it's very difficult to persuade people that some sort of future is going to be preferable to the past because I think people are very, um, people, people tend to be conservative with a small t in terms of their sort of assumptions about who they are and what they want and what they want to do and, and that kind of stuff. So the idea of radical change is something that's quite frightening. And we can think about that in some quite material ways. I mean, say, for example, flying less. So, you know, are, are we going to tell people that they can no longer fly off for their summer holidays? So much of the discussion in the last uh, week or two has really been about people's holidays, about their desire to go back to, you know, the beaches of Portugal and Spain, for example. That's a really difficult conversation to have with people, but I think it's going to be a necessary one, whether we like it or not. And that's going to involve um, political leadership, um, not following opinion, but shaping it, um, and trying to articulate the importance of a different way of relating to both the planet and each other. Um, and at the moment, we lack that political leadership, in my opinion. Um, we don't really have anybody who's committed to, for example, radical versions of the Green New Deal, 
um, which would involve public expenditure in terms of decarbonizing the economy and so on. The point of the book is to say that this is a moment where we should be pushing for that stuff, where there's a moment of pause, of possibility, of reset, and we should be arguing for those kinds of things. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, so I've got a question here from Ayushi Rawat from India, um, who says, um, have you looked at any gendered aspects of work post COVID and how that might influence our working lives and the question of gendered labor? Mm, yeah, a great question. And yeah, I mean, I mentioned that very briefly when I was talking about domestic labor, obviously with the idea that women bear the primary uh, burden of care. So, you know, for both children and old people and people with um, disabilities and so on. So that interferes with the, their possibilities for um, engaging in various forms of work at home. It's also very clear, of course, that the um, gender division of labour in terms of, say, care work, for example, has meant that um, many women, uh, particularly working class women, have been exposed for relatively poor amounts of money to much more danger than, um, say, you know, relatively well paid men like me who can stay in their shed. So, yeah, of course, these things are absolutely gendered. I don't think gender is the only dimension. You know, I mentioned the idea of social class and of ethnicity and uh, also disability. But gender is an important dimension in thinking about the distribution of any inequalities. Yes, absolutely. Um, question about developing countries after COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and many other viruses have been existing along alongside it and like corruption, yeah. unemployment, overpopulation. How do you think um, this current situation is going to affect them? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge question, isn't it? You know, that in terms of the idea of some sort of transition to a different kind of economy, talking about that from the perspective of the relatively affluent global north um, is, um, is one thing. Imagining that that might be the case for um, uh, a whole series of people in the global south, who many of whom simply lack access to the kind of what we would regard to be the um, uh, essentials of life. Yeah, um, you know, holidays and TVs and all this kind of stuff, things that we would take very much for granted. Um, if we're going to talk about radical forms of change, then it's absolutely vital, I think, that we connect together ideas about inequality and ideas about carbon reduction and consequently think about essentially about questions of justice. Um, after all, if we don't transition to a new economy without thinking about justice, then there's a whole, whole series of people on the planet and in this city who are simply not going to buy into this idea. You know, it's, going to, it's, it's effectively going to be a bunch of rich people taking things away from people who never had them in the first place. So, yeah, the politics of this are incredibly complicated. Absolutely. And, I, and then, in fact, we have another question here on inequality while well, we're on the topic, um, saying historically crises are used to push through unpopular policies which have increased inequality. Are you hopeful that the recovery from this crisis might be different? I don't quite agree with the premise of the question. I think crises can do uh, different things. Uh, so you might be referring to Naomi Klein in the shock doctrine, which is kind of one of the famous statements of this idea that crises are kind of used essentially as a sort of a wedge to um, make the rich richer and the poor poorer, that sort of, that sort of idea. And I, you know, I'm not saying that that's not true in many contexts. I think crises can also play other sorts of functions. Um, and there's no particular reason to assume pessimism from the start. We might as well, just, we might as well try some optimism. Um, in which case, we could talk about, say, for example, you know, the crisis of the Second World War being inadvertently the midwife of the National Health Service, an organisation that many of us would feel pretty positive about. So there's no particular reason to assume that we can't re-engineer good stuff. And when you've got, um, as we do at present, you know, a Tory government that appears to be committed to um, <laughs> an essentially Corbynite manifesto, then I think all bets are off. You know, the, the, the questions of public spending, ideas about levelling up and so on, if they're, if they're not more than mere smoke and mirrors, then, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I'd want to push anyway. I might want to radicalise it a bit more than they do, but essentially, you know, even the Tories currently seem to be heading in a reasonably... Um, uh, interesting direction. Yeah, um, I'm getting quite a lot of questions um, about um, unemployment. Um, Chris Joseph asks, in your opinion, what should the government do to fight against the unemployment issues that might arise in a post-COVID era? And more generally, how easy is it going to be able to get a job in the post-COVID era? Yeah, yeah. 
It's a huge question, isn't it? And, you know, for, for, for many people, um, particularly younger people, I think, the, uh, uh, the prospects now look positively grim. You know, if we add the uh, COVID, COVID unemployment crisis to the climate crisis um, and the future looks bleak uh, for many people. I think one of the one of the things that that's been demonstrated very clearly by the magic money tree over the last four months is that we can use state leverage in order to effectively produce jobs. After all, what the furlough scheme has been doing is simply staving off mass unemployment. There's no particular reason to assume that we couldn't target that kind of investment in the production of green jobs. Now, that's not just a, you know, a kind of a, a, a sort of a cliche it's a very obvious thing to do right now so for example the city of bristol has, co has committed uh, to um, zero carbon in its direct emissions by 2030 that's going to require an enormous amount of investment in a whole variety of things redesigning transport systems thinking about solar panels wind farms etc cetera, etc cetera. but one of those is going to be replacing gas boilers Right. So that means replacing gas boilers in lots and lots of houses. And that means we're going to need an awful lot of electricity or um, what do you call them? The heat, 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 heat boiler things. I can't remember the call. I'm not, obviously not an expert on this. Right. Uh, on different kinds of boilers. Don't ask so, me. Yeah, just on different <laughs> kinds of boilers. Uh, and that's going to mean jobs and investment and all the rest of it. There's no particular reason why we shouldn't be stimulating that kind of economy. Yeah. If we've got state investment that we can put into furlough effectively into you know, asking people to stay at home and, uh, you know, and, and watch Netflix, then there's no reason why we couldn't be putting that kind of investment into generating other kinds of jobs. Because, you know, let's be clear that any kind of green economy is going to be a jobs heavy economy. We're not going to be talking about vast amounts of automation or hugely complicated logistics chains, you know, bringing us vegetables from Africa or wherever it might be. It's going to be an economy which is going to be much more localised and in which many of the products that we're making, that, that we'll, we'll be consuming, will be things which are produced by people in local areas. So I think it's going to require a lot of re-engineering, but the possibilities for generating jobs are clearly there. Yeah, absolutely. Right, we've still got loads of questions coming in, but I think we've got time for about two more. Um, okay. Georgina Lyons says, and this is on well-being, the government yeah. has announced all sorts of initiatives to encourage greater well-being, e.g. more bike paths, banning junk food advertising. Mm. Do you think these will work? And if not, should what should we be doing instead to improve overall well-being for all of society in a post-COVID world? It's a huge question, isn't it? I mean, I don't think well-being is one <laughs> thing. You know, I think I think that, that that people's experience, just like the experience of COVID, is very, very different. For some people, well-being will be having a decent flat to live in, you know, or um, a, a neighbourhood which isn't hasn't got so much crime or whatever it might be. For other people, it might involve working less, um, spending more time with their kids, wh whatever it is. I think what behind this is a bigger question about how we measure the economy. So the variety of people who've talked about this idea that measures measures of, an, of economic efficiency, of productivity and all the rest of it are really pretty meaningless in terms of um, our experience of our lives as human beings. And we'd be kind of better off measuring happiness yeah, and thinking about how how the economy works to produce happy human beings. That's a really complicated question. There's a, a, an organization in Bristol, um, which used to be called Happy Cities, that, 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 uh, that's been working on those kinds of questions for quite a long time. But I think it suggests that we think about the economy rather differently, rather than it being a sort of an alien creature that simply does things to us and needs to be fed in order that it's efficient and you know, that the stock market keeps going up and it keeps growing all the rest of it. Think rather about what the economy does to human beings in terms of their, their, their welfare more broadly. Finally, probably the biggest question of all, just in case. Oh, you all right, then. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Is it really going to be life after COVID or, in fact, life with COVID-19? Mm, I don't know, because I don't know anything about vaccines other than what I've read. So, I mean, at the moment, we're waiting for a vaccine before we can return to any kind of normality. Um, the history of most uh, pandemics... Um, you know, if we go back to the Black Death or whatever, is that, uh, you know, they're around for quite a long time, but they're not around forever. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we will be living with subversions of the coronavirus, of, of, yeah, of coronaviruses for quite a long time. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be living in these kinds of ways, I think. After all, you know, if you look at a sort of a, 
uh, a graph of the Black Death, effectively what you see is a big peak and then a series of smaller peaks until eventually it dies out. And that's partly because it you know, killed about a third of the population of Europe. That's not going to be the case with us. So though I think um, COVID is going to be around for a long time, I'm not sure that it's accurate to, to suggest we're going to be living with it in the way that we are now forever. <laughs> so thank you very much, um, Martin, and thank you for taking so many questions. And um, thank you to everyone for joining us at the at Bristol University Press webinar today. And sorry if we didn't manage to get to your question. Life After COVID-19, The Other Side of Crisis will be published as a print and ebook on the 12th of August. It can be purchased at 20% discount from our website, bristoluniversitypress.co.uk, or 35% discount if you sign up to our mailing list. And the link to do that is in the chat. We're taking a break from our webinars during August and we'll be restarting them in September with an exciting autumn programme. Please see our social media or website for details. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed.